Okay, so by redefining karma the way he did, the Buddha gives us a really, really powerful tool to work with, way to work on ourselves, that, you know, part of what makes it so powerful is we can get really directly in touch with it and we can actually experience the, the benefits of it as, as they develop. As we, as we make good karma for ourselves, we can feel ourselves changing. And so it, uh, it becomes a really a, a super powerful tool in that way. We can, we can experience ourselves suffering less. Um, the other thing is that it allows actions and their consequences to obey the other laws of causality. And that's important. And uh, these other laws of causality, they're not, uh, well, they are important. After all, if you, if you are a, a greedy, hateful person, what kind of a life are you going to have? Miserable. Greedy, hateful life. <laughs> yeah, but does the person who's living it see it that way? Yes, I think the person living it does see it that way. That, that, that they're going to... Uh, uh, well, they're constantly filled with hate. That sucks. That, well, that sucks. But the thing is that how do people treat a greedy person? Like a greedy person. I treat them like politicians instead of... It depends. If they're powerful, they might treat them with great reverence. If it's a powerful person that you, you're fearful of... Well, uh, there are, of course, there are other factors that are involved. You know, psychology is psychology. And, and poor people suck up to rich people, even though they know that rich people are never going to give them any other money. I never did understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in your life, you know that, you know that, uh, and if you, well, you take the, the precepts. If you're a person that, uh, isn't honest, people know you're not honest. And people don't trust you, right? And it affects what happens to you. But that's not that's not karma. Not not it's not the Buddha's karma. But it's still it's still a consequence. On the other hand, if you're a person that's always honest, people know that and, and it has good consequences for you. So there are good consequences in the world to your actions. And so if you if you are if you are selfish, if you are a thief, if you're a liar, um, if you run other people down uh, in, in conversation, uh, if you speak uh, harshly and unkindly to people, you're going to you're going to be treated accordingly. So you're you're going to get the consequences of those actions, in addition to the bad karma that you're making for yourself. That isn't the bad karma. It's in addition to the bad karma. And the same thing, if you if you are if you're a good person in all the ways that are the opposite of this, you are going to be more loved. You're going to be better treated, better respected. Uh, all kinds of good things are going to happen to you. So, also, we live in a world with a lot of problems. If you believe everything is due to karma, I've heard people say, "Well, you know, I'm not sure." what the point is of me trying to make a difference in, in the world because the people that are suffering all these bad things is their karma. And, uh, and then somebody who belongs to that same school of thought will say to them something like, well, no, 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 it, 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 you're right, it won't really make any difference to them, but it'll make a difference to you because you, you'll, you'll be you'll be doing good acts and you'll get the benefits of your good acts, even if you can't make a difference. Now, how motivated does that leave you to try to end world hunger or bring an end to uh, sex trade, white slavery, or any of these other things, try to bring an end to warfare? If you're coming from a place where, uh, well, what I do isn't going to make any difference anyway, but I might as well do it because it's good for me. <laughs> You're not going to be very effective. Right. Although, if you come from a place 
but where you're you're doing it out of genuine caring and love, uh, it's going to empower you. If you're doing it because you really care about these people that are suffering, you'll find ways to make a difference. And there's all the reason that there ever was to still go ahead and do those things. That makes it very that makes it even more important to do those things. There's another kind of consequence that of an interaction between karma and consequences in the world that I'll point out to you too. Your your karma in the Buddhist sense, the kind of person that you make yourself into, has a really major effect on where you are, the kind of circumstances you're in, the people you're around, and of course how you react to the circumstances that you're in and, and what happens to you. And that has consequences. That has worldly consequences. So if, if you are uh, if, if you are a person who would rather walk two blocks to your hotel down a dark street in a city you're not familiar with rather than spend 30 bucks for a cab and you get mugged. Now getting mugged isn't really the result of your karma but being on that street is. See what I mean? You chose to be on that street because of the kind of person you are. You've made yourself into a person who counts saving 20 or 30 bucks as more important than, than the risk that you're taking. And so if, if you get mugged, it's due to worldly causality. You happen to be there and the mugger happened to be there and that was, that was the intention he had in his mind. But you put yourself in that situation. If you keep, if you keep bad company and you get into trouble because of the company you keep, well, the trouble you get into because of keeping that company that's due to the other kinds of causality. Physical, biological, psychological. But the fact that that's who you associate with, that's a result of your karma. You've made yourself into the kind of person who chooses to be in that kind of company. So these interact. Karma is, karma is one of the five kinds of causality. I didn't mention the fifth kind. That is dharmic. dharmic. You have karmic causality and you have dharmic causality. That is the causality that results from understanding the dharma, from understanding the way things really are. Becoming awakened is the result of dharmic causality. Now, it's important to note that you cannot become awakened by making good karma alone. Making good karma is really important. Making good karma is going to enormously enhance uh, the possibility and the probability of you becoming awakened. But by itself, if you did nothing but make good karma, it is not going to eliminate the ignorance and the delusion that is, is driving you. You may succeed in temporarily suppressing desire and aversion totally and living as a very good person, enjoying all of the worldly consequences of being a good person. So there are benefits to that. But good karma alone will not eliminate delusion. That's why in the Eightfold Path uh, there is that third part, because really the second part, virtue, uh, well, right intention as well. A combination of right intention, which is in the wisdom component, and then the right speech, right action, and like right livelihood that are in the virtue, that's really all about karma. But the Buddha didn't teach the noble fivefold path. <laughs> Noble Eightfold Cup is what he taught. Because the, the last part of this path, uh, right effort, uh, right meditation, and right mindfulness, these are essential for you to achieve the insight 
and and the uh, to actually overcome the ignorance, attain the wisdom, and uh, achieve the liberation and awakening that you're after. And so, look carefully at the spiritual path that you're following, because if it does not cultivate these meditation qualities, it doesn't cult cultivate, uh, actually, samadhi is the word that I translated as meditation in that list. If it doesn't cultivate samadhi and mindfulness, then it's going to be, it's going to be a three-wheeled car. It's not, going to, it's not going to get you where you want to go as quickly, driving on one rim. My father did that. My father's 90 years old. <laughs> and he likes to go for a little drive in the country after he uh, goes to church on Sunday. So a few, a few weeks ago, uh, he went through Tombstone, and there's a dirt road, dirt back road from Tombstone to, to Sun Sites, which is nearest to where we live. Just outside of, of Tombstone, he had a tire went flat and uh, you know it's, he's 90 years old so of course he didn't want to change his tire but he, he also why on earth he didn't call us or call AAA I, I don't know but he didn't he decided that he was going to tough it out and he'd drive the car 30 miles to Sunset on a flat tire <laughs> <laughs> he got there <laughs> He got there. Needless to say, it took a long time. <laughs> the tire was long gone. <laughs> the rim was long gone. <laughs> the brake rotor had been dragging on the ground. And after it was delivered, he's had to have it repaired twice more since then because of other things that got broken and damaged being dragged over the rocky dirt road. So. Anyway, make make sure that uh, make sure that the vehicle you choose to get where you want to go has three good three uh, has four good tires, right? Don't try to make it on three. Make sure it includes practices that cultivate uh, concentration and mindfulness. Concentration and awareness. Is he still driving? A 90-year-old from driving. <laughs> <laughs> so acts motivated by ignorance, desire, and aversion rebound upon you by strengthening ignorance and craving, making you more vulnerable to suffering in the future, no matter what happens to you. Right? But because of the other factors that we've mentioned, not only are you going to suffer more no matter what happens to you, because of the other kinds of causality, there's a good chance that there's some not too good things going to happen to you. <laughs> Conversely, acts motivated by unselfishness, harmlessness, generosity, and loving kindness rebound upon you by making you less vulnerable to suffering, more prone to happiness, no matter what happens to you. And likewise, those actions, though, are going to have their own consequences in the world, but you're going to probably mean that not quite so many bad things happen and maybe a few better things do. But it's as simple as that. You don't sound very, very convinced. Maybe. You, you well, because there's too many other factors involved. There's too many other factors involved. No matter how many good acts you perform in the world, you know, doesn't keep your house from burning down, doesn't keep your, your children from getting sick and dying, you know. And that's, that's a really important thing to, to realize, that if you want to evaluate the success of this practice, then don't just look at what happens to you. Look at how you respond to it. And, and both are really important. Otherwise, when bad things happen to you, you might think, oh, well, what's the point? 
especially if you've already become convinced that, well, I'm not going to get my reward in a future life when I get reincarnated, then you might think, well, what's the point then? Bad things still happen to me. So, yeah. So, um, so if, um, so achieving, uh, becoming awakened in this life, yeah. um, or getting closer to it, is, yeah. is just kind of how to best use this life. That's, yes. Use this life in the best way that you possibly can. Which, that's what these practices are about. And, and if you don't make it, then you don't make it. Like, well, the thing is, like, not like this if, it's a if, if you, that's the personal you self you think you are, doesn't make it. Right. But it will help others make it. Or you, you others. Somebody right. else, somebody else is going to make it. Right. And what you do uh, is, is helping them to make it. It's just that, the, and, and you are the, the other person right, that's right. going to make it, but you, you aren't that person in the, in the right. personal self view. Five advocates, right. Yes, right, yeah. Okay. You are everyone. You, you've already been become awakened many times. That's job, job. Alice. That's a job. And, including <laughs> including 2,500 years ago when you made all these teachings that we're taking the benefit of it now. But. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> and you will become awakened many times in the future. Hopefully one of them will be, while well, this five aggregate still holds together. But if not, that's not too important. That's a minor detail. So that's how, okay, okay, okay. So we we become awakened. We did something wrong, and now we're like we're like ground zero, and we're trying to get back up. I mean, like. No, no. We are uh, we are all one. So. That concept is very like we are all one. It's it's not. Yeah. I know. I know. It's. It's very broad. Like, it's very broad. <laughs> <laughs> it's the broadest. Like, like a very vast. Um, what I was pointing out there is is not that you've somehow been awakened and fallen down to zero. It's that you in one form has become awakened and you in another form gets to do it all over again. Now, when you when you say form, what does that mean? Form. This five aggregates. <clears throat> I think she wants something more concrete. Yeah, something starts to lose it. But there really isn't anything more concrete. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe this would help. Maybe it won't. If you were stripped of all of your memories, all of those personality characteristics that you identify <coughs> as yourself, if you were somehow totally stripped of them, and then you, whatever it is that's left, were transplanted into somebody else's body, and that body came with its whole set of memories and its whole set of personality characteristics. Would you still be you? I wouldn't be me in the form of like uh, brown hair, brown eyes. The, the, the identity me, like the, the label that I put me, yeah. I am Laura, I have no hair, the virus personality, blah, blah, blah. Like that aspect of me would not be there. Would, would you right? say, I would be, but I wouldn't be, at the same time? No, because it would contradict itself, like... Well, what would you say then? Would you be you? No. You wouldn't be you at all? I might have the memories of me, but is yeah, it really my no, memories? I've already no. said you don't get to have the memories of me. No. you got a completely new self Would you be... Would you... Would the you that you are now and the you that you would be after I transplanted you, would they be the same or would they be different? They'd be different. You don't think that you would feel the same about 
being that person with those memories and those characteristics, would, would there not be some quality that was... The reasons, no, 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 no. Because none of my memories would be there. None of me uh -huh. would be there. Okay. And there would just be like... If you had amnesia, if you were in a car and you got hit on the head and you lost your memories, but you had the same body, would you still be you? Memories aren't there. I mean, it might have the same body, but the memories aren't there. So you are your memories. Mm, no, that's part of me. Okay, what's the other part? Well, I, in order, for, in order for me to happen, I guess you would have to have uh, the memory, the, the the long hair, the this and that. Th those contributing factors in order for, to make a whole, supposedly, right? Because you. I mean, <laughs> I mean, would would one finger make me? What? How could you identify my finger from the rest of the fingers? <laughs> yeah, right. How could you? You know, what I what I would say is that there is a sense in which you would be the same, and there's a sense in which you would be different. All the things that you identify with as yourself right now would be gone. So in that sense, you're different. I agree with you. You're right. But that subjective experience of being a conscious being in a body with the memories and all the other characteristics is exactly the same. So this this is something to, it is worth thinking about. You see, the Buddha basically said that when you die and another person comes into existence, um, whatever it is that you think you are, that is not what comes into existence in some other person in the future. Whatever is reborn, it's not the self that you think you are. And, okay. I, and I can agree with that. Okay. I, that aspect I don't have a problem with. Right. And so he was asked, well then, what does continue after I die then? Now the, the question wasn't what gets reincarnated or what, you know, it's what does continue after I die? And his answer was the, the, uh, the, the ripening of your karma. That's what continues. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so then the next question was, so does the person who experiences the ripening of my karma, is that person the same or different? But the point is that there is no separate you to begin with. You are all of these people, you just don't know it. You're all of the people that have ever been, you don't know it. And you're all of the people that will ever be. Your karma, there is no self. There is no separate self right now, in this moment. There is the person that wakes up tomorrow with your memories and your body and your personality characteristics. Is that the same person that you are right now? The answer is exactly the same. It both is and it isn't. It's like when I transplanted whatever you are into somebody else's body. That's like you waking up. You waking up the next morning, but somehow you woke up with different memories, you would get out of bed and you wouldn't know that anything had changed. You check all your memories and they matched. Yeah, yesterday I did this, the day before I did that, and I'm like, yeah, that's me, all right, I'm here. This body, you look down at your fine masculine body and your oriental <laughs> skin and, and, uh, <laughs> and 
uh, and, and your 60-year-old uh, face in the mirror, and you say, yep, that's me. It's the same one I've always been. You, <laughs> That's the experience you'd have. Subjectively, you'd say, that's me, and you'd also ask the question, you know, well, when I die, uh, what's going to continue on? <laughs> Put it another way, you know, it's just you know, go back to re when you're reincarnated, isn't it just like being transplanted? You don't remember anything from a previous life. Your body's <laughs> different, your body's completely different, it's a different age. 50 50 chance it'll be a different sex. Everything. I'm still not convinced it's you, though. What's that? I'm still not convinced it's you, though. Well, what's you? But you never existed in the first place. <laughs> I mean, I still function, even though I don't exist in the big, in the big picture. Like I, I'm still here. I'm still like I'm, I'm, I'm occupying space. It doesn't mean I can't exist or won't exist. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know that that a whole terminology is like kind of. It's very like. Uh, it's like yeah, you're you're right. It's very messy. It's your human mind trying to exceed its limitations, which it can't really do. But let me tell you something. You will never become awakened. But that five aggregates, I hope, will become awakened quite soon. And when it does, you won't be there. Ooh. Because <laughs> <laughs> the idea of you is the ignorance. Is the that ignorance, is that's the right. Ignorance. It's and the that delusion. Be, the, idea, the idea of you is the delusion. Right. And that will go away. And when that goes away, you, you will be awakened. You're awakened, you can look back at your former you and say, I made it. That's right. <laughs> How, could you look back at your former you? Could you look back at it? But in that case, but it's just been disillusioned. In, in that case, your five aggregates are still together. It's just, it's just the illusion of you that is gone. So those five aggregates can become awakened, but you can't. So, so like you're talking about. So removing my ignorance that I can't get enlightened, and then like I get enlightened, and then that goes away and it's washed yeah. out, and then that, you, you, the rest of me right. becomes enlightened. You remove the delusion, the, the ignorance. You remove that, and you are awake. But if you okay, just for argument's sake. But even if or when you're awakened, just for practical purposes, you will still speak of, I, like, I'm going there now, I'm hungry. You won't say, my five right. aggregates are, <laughs> <laughs> my five aggregates are hungry. That's right, yeah. So there's something that stays. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And, and that is what somebody brought up to the Buddha once. They said, you know, so, uh, you, 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 you have no self anymore, but you still say, I, me, and mine. And he says, yeah, it's a convenience. <laughs> That's right. For all practical purposes. But uh, I guess the important thing to, to get across is that what you're attached to and what you stand to lose is worth nothing. It's not, you're attached to it, but when you understand what it really is, you'll be glad to see it go, because you will have lost nothing but an illusion. You will not lose yourself. You will not lose you. You will lose an illusion. When that illusion goes away. If you, if you, these five aggregates do not become awakened in this lifetime, you will die still being you. Or right, let's see. Let me put this different. You will die still feeling like I am me. You'll die feeling like I am me. And if you die feeling like I am me, somebody else is going to be born to take your place, and they're going to feel like I am me. In that sense, it's the same. You 
are going to be as long as anybody, as long as there's a sentient being in the world who thinks, I am me, then you are reborn as that person. So you would be reborn more like everybody then as a specific person. Because otherwise you couldn't also explain that the population is growing, but so there's mm -hmm. some new people who haven't been there in numbers before. So it's more like you are reborn in everybody, not in a particular person. Because otherwise the number of people on earth would be somehow conserved. You're not including sentient beings yeah. of all kinds. Well, okay. well, yeah, but even sentient beings of all kinds, I doubt that there is yeah. the same number, like one dies, one gets born. Yeah, it's pretty unlikely, isn't yeah. it? I mean, we look, look back in history, and there was a beginning of life where there wasn't any people, and the mm -hmm. beings that we were, that there were, were very few. So. I'm confused because that the last thing you said kind of implies to me that there would be some stream of consciousness or or uh, that karma would be carried from one person to another, which I thought was not the case. There's not, that is not the case. That's not what I was saying. Okay. okay. Even while you sit here, somebody else is being born who feels like I am me, and that is you too. You, what you really are, is that sense that I am me. In addition, and that's what you can dispense with. You don't need the sense that I am me. The other thing that you are, you really are, is a collection of five aggregates, which arises due to causes and conditions and will pass away due to causes and conditions. And many other uh, similar collection of aggregates will arise and pass away. And you will reappear every time one of those five aggregates says, I am me. But then another sense of what you really are is not separate. And that's, that's the difficult sense, is that if you get rid of I am me, well, what are, if I am not me, what am I? And if there is no boundary, if I am not separate, what am I? I'm everything. I'm everyone. As long as there's a part of you that's separate, though, that separate part is going to suffer. I think I get what you're saying. The part that's confusing is, so if there's a part of consciousness that is enlightened, is awakened, realizes that there is no separateness, realizes that uh, there is no separation, yeah. that there is no you, no me, um, no I, then I guess my confusion is how is it that part of the consciousness realizes that and part of consciousness doesn't real and some of the aggregates don't realize that mm -hmm. and so therefore it's as if all of consciousness, like you said, um, is still not yeah. awakened, mm -hmm. but if one heap of five aggregates has awakened and that aspect or that piece of the sky or that you know little cube in the water has awakened I'm trying to reconcile you know consciousness is one mm -hmm. so where is the division between the consciousness that has awakened and the consciousnesses, or the consciousness of the other heaps, mm -hmm. the other aggregates that have not. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, well, yeah, let's look at it this way. Okay. You have five aggregates. There's consciousness. There's all the different parts of the mind that contribute at different times to consciousness, right? All these different parts of your mind. So you've got many parts to your mind, right? Like the subconscious, the conscious... No, no, well, you have you have the conscious, you have you have consciousness, and then you have all of these many other parts of your mind that only intermittently contribute to consciousness. Consciousness is the place that all these parts of your mind communicate. One part of your mind 
puts an idea into consciousness. And when it puts that idea into consciousness, all the other parts of your mind can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Or another part of your mind, connected with the sense of seeing, puts an image into consciousness. And when it puts that image into consciousness, all the other parts of the mind can see that image. And this part over here could say, hey, that image corresponds to something really nice, uh, that feels good, we should go after that. And so it puts that idea into consciousness. And so you have the intention of going after it. Okay? All these different parts of your mind. Consciousness is just how the different parts of your mind communicate with each other. Right? Okay, so you are five aggregates. Your mind has many parts. They interact in consciousness. So you reach, you, you become wiser as you, carry, as you continue this practice, and certain parts of your mind are becoming wiser. And that reaches a critical mass, and you make the transition to becoming a stream enterer. So there are, at that point, some parts of your mind have achieved insight and are awakened. But there's still other parts of your mind that are not. So you keep practicing, and you progress from being a stream enterer to being a, a once returner and a non returner. And at each stage, more and more parts of your mind become awake. And finally, you become an arhat. And that's all the parts of your mind that belong to this five aggregates are now awakened. Okay? But consciousness, consciousness is universal, it's everywhere. The consciousness in this five aggregates is just one manifestation of consciousness. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the division between this collection of minds that you call you, and you say belongs to this five aggregates, is really a false division. But we just talked about it as though there were 213 minds that were Tessa, mm -hmm. and they were separate apart from all these other minds that are Chris and Steve and Laurie and everybody else. But that's not really true. It's not really like that. That's just an imaginary line that your mind imposes and it says, we're, we're, you know, consciousness is like a place that we communicate. We're not going to let these other minds communicate in, in, in our consciousness space. But that's not the way it really is. When you become awakened, you've dropped that boundary. And so, any, any other mind that belongs to any other collection of aggregates has the potential now to share in that awakened consciousness. Because you, you've taken down your boundary. What will limit it is the boundary that these other minds maintain to keep themselves separate. Okay, we look at the world as a whole. Okay. All of the different minds that make up capital M mind that uh, <coughs> appear to be separated in these little cons. And now we have one part of it that's awakened and it's dissolved its boundary. But by dissolving its boundary, then we create a situation now we're kind of back where we were when you were, say, a stream entrant. Where you've got one part of capital M mind that's awakened, and you've got other parts of capital M mind that are not yet awakened. So that's why we could say, you, and this is not the separate you, but this is the real you that's everything, is partly awakened, but you, in this sense, will not be fully awakened until all of them are awakened. But all of them are more awakened just because you, in the other sense, in the personal sense, by you becoming awakened, all are more awakened. And eventually, all will become awake. So then, it's more like each person really is just a point of perspective, Pers a point yes. of uh, like like a little hole in the sphere. Like like you know, if I guess the idea that came to my mind was like this huge sphere of light, or you know, this huge sphere, and like lots of little holes, and each hole is a person looking out. That's right. And each one of us thinks that it's just that that is everything, but really it's... 
That's I don't right. know. So each perspective of consciousness can become awakened without the whole immediately. Because I mean, when you know, when people say everyone has to become awakened for one person to become awakened, or you know, uh, or you can't become awakened until everybody becomes awakened. But really, they mean the you as. Yes, that's right. So um, I think that has been in the past confusing to me, and um, so one person can become awakened. That's why I was confused. If there is no separation, how one person can become awakened without everybody becoming awakened, but it's because that one perspective can still look at everything. Everything hasn't changed, but everybody else is still looking at the same thing, not able to see what that perspective or their point of perspective is. Right. I'm not able to say it. But <laughs> well, it sounds like you got it. You, you figured it out. It sounds like you understand it. I, I, my my human mind model, I think, is starting to make more sense of it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So it, it sounds like you're you're now working with a model in your mind that is much more satisfactory. Yeah. Let's put it that way. And actually, you will continue to suffer until the big you is com has completely. That's suffered. right. That's right. And that's why we could have we were all awoken to a twenty five hundred years ago, and we're here now. That's right. Yeah. right. Well, no, wouldn't you not? I mean, the big you. Or, wait, you mean you continue to suffer? Not an arhat doesn't continue. Well, well the, you mean you mean the you, the big you. The big you. The, the yeah. there is still the suffering. Big, yes, lots of. There is still you. suffering <laughs> in, in the, the universe. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. In the universe. Yes. Yeah. The big you of which there is only one continues to suffer. Yes. Gotcha. But the, 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 the little you, which is the... Uh, five aggregates, right? Is what? The five aggregate you. Yeah, the five aggregate you has ceased to suffer. Right? Until those aggregates dissolve, and right. then you're back right in there. Yeah. Yes? Um, this is my perception. I don't know how clear it is. We, we have um, a whole bunch of different pieces in our brain, all different minds, and that's why we fight all the time with ourselves. Yeah. Okay. If we try to align all of those pieces together and have one mind, is that enlightenment? Um, you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When when all of them know the same truth, then they all become unified. Yeah. You know, I'm always looking for shortcuts, <laughs> and and uh, do you have to? How much do you under have to understand what's going on rather than just doing it? Because I see a lot of energy trying to go into understanding, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not sure that it's helpful. Well, well, it's. It's it's it is helpful, but it's not necessary. You can you can drive a car without understanding how the engine works or the brakes or any of these other things. Right? But it can it, it can certainly be helpful to know these things about how the car works. In other Only words, if it breaks down, okay. Well, well, that's that's right. right. So well, I'll, 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 <laughs> well, breakdowns. Don't even only if it stops responding to the things that you know how to do. Maybe a better example would be a computer. It's sort of like you might know how to drive a car, but you never knew it had a parking brake. And if you were ignorant that it had a parking brake, and you got in it one day and the parking brake was set, then you'd, you'd have trouble. The trouble would come because you didn't know enough about cars. It wouldn't be that it had broken down. That's the way I am with all of these, all of this computer technology and everything else. It stops doing what I want, and it's not broken. I just don't know enough about it. And somebody else comes along and says, "Oh no, no, no! All you have to do is just open, open this, reset that. And there you go." And it's all, oh, great. It's really useful to know these things. I I can use my computer without knowing all these things, but I probably waste an awful lot of time and don't get as much done because I keep running up against these things that I don't know enough about. So there is value. So the answer to the question, how much do you need to know? Well, you need to know enough 
number one, to motivate you to do the practice. And number two, to know how to overcome the obstacles that you encounter along the way. And if you know very little, you'll go along really fine until you hit one of those obstacles. And then you'll need to either learn more than you did before or at least have somebody available that you can ask to get past that obstacle. So there's not, in other words, there's not a, a set an answer to how much you need to know. If you knew everything, then you'd sail right through and every obstacle that came, you'd just fix it and move on. If you knew nothing at all, you might be lucky and not hit any obstacles and you'd sail right through. And, I mean, that does happen. People who come awake and don't know any of this stuff at all. It does happen. It's just that it doesn't happen very often. So how much you need to know, it depends. It really depends on the obstacles you hit along the way. When you hit an obstacle that you don't know how to get around, it means you don't know enough. That's I can see, did you still have a question, Sarah? Yeah. Um, I wonder, I don't know if you're planning to talk more about the distinction between the way you're using the term reborn and reincarnation, which I know is an important one and I think often gets very blurred. Yeah, what we're going to talk about this afternoon with the 12 links of dependent origination is how the Buddha redefined that idea. And with, with karma and nirvana and samsara, he continued to use the same words that people use. But um, uh, at, at least in Buddhism since then, there's been some attempt to try to say rebirth instead of reincarnation to distinguish between the two. And it just struck me as the conversation was going on here in the last little while, especially there is that tendency we have in our mind one, I think it's two, is to, you know, I die, I'm reborn as this person in a body that correlates to my current life. I mean, that's the whole reincarnation thing that goes yeah. itself on that, which is what you said at all. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just wondering, because you were talking about obstacles, what were you referring to maybe as, or were you referring to anything specifically as maybe the biggest obstacles that you would need to overcome? There, there are many different kinds of obstacles uh, along the path. Okay. I mean, what would you say would be the biggest ones, or do you have it? Well, Most of, the, most of the obstacles are in the form of some kind of wrong view, some kind of misunderstanding. Okay. That uh, you, you end up getting stuck and not making any, any further progress. And it's because you, you have a pretty good idea of how things are in your mind. And it doesn't okay. correspond to the way they really are. So no matter how hard you keep trying to make things work doing the same thing, if it's the wrong thing to do. Oh, okay. I was thinking that, okay, within your meditation practice, but I guess that is part of Well, the uh, and that does happen in your meditation okay. practice. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't understand the need for purification of your virtue and your intentions, mm -hmm. in your meditation practice, you're going to reach a point where you try to, where, where you try to improve your concentration and all you do is jerk and twitch and itch and, mm -hmm. and, and hurt and you don't get past that. Mm -hmm. right? And so there's an obstacle and if you didn't know better you'd think it was a problem with your practice and you'd keep trying to solve it through some way with your practice but you wouldn't know that what you really need to do is, is take care of all those things that are working in your unconscious about the things that you've done that you shouldn't have done and left undone that you should have done and, you know, the, the, the worries and fears that you have about the consequences of those things and all that other stuff. You should take care of that outside of... Outside of you have to take care of that, that outside of... Oh, okay, and then yeah. your sits will be more productive, what you're saying. But there's a, a lot of obstacles like okay. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well... I think it's about time to have lunch. Um, so good karma in the form of good intentions moves us in the direction of nirvana and liberation. 
and away from suffering, bad karma in the form of bad intentions moves us towards samsara and increased suffering. And this is the law of karma taught by the Buddha. And this karma is about not what happens to you, but who it happens to. And so we'll use, we'll move on after lunch to talk about dependent arising in the form of these 12 links, which will allow us to look at how Buddha defined what it meant to be re reborn. Okay? So have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.